Welcome to Food for Thought Podcast. The audio is much better than this. Trust me, I am improvising. We have construction noise that's been going on all week, and that's why I wasn't able to record. This episode you're about to listen to bears repeating. It is a rebroadcast, but it's worth listening to again. Welcome to Food for Thought, by the way. Thank you for listening. My name is Colleen Patrick Gaudreau. I am your host. You can find me at joyfulvegan.com. You can also find me on Instagram and Facebook and Clubhouse. Most recently, where I've been hosting rooms every day on how to live compassionately and healthfully. I can't wait until Clubhouse is open to everyone. Right now, it's open to those who have an iPhone and to those who have an invitation. If you are a supporter, I did write to you on the Patreon platform to let you know that I have invitations to give you if you're interested. So just make sure you go over to your Patreon account and check that out. I'm working every day on new episodes and I've got some to share with you, but I couldn't record because of the construction. So enjoy this episode. Be sure to go over to joyfulvegan.com, become a supporter, join the mailing list, get your free Joyful Vegan starter guide and check out the exciting online vegan cooking classes I've got coming up. I hope you're well. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Thank you for sharing it. Thank you for reviewing it. And I look forward to connecting with you here and there and everywhere. Take care. I have said for years that vegans have to stop overusing the word vegan, and I want to elaborate on that here. We say vegan, vegan, vegan everything, vegan ice cream, vegan cake, vegan lunch, vegan restaurant, I'm vegan. I've often joked that to demystify what vegan is for non-vegans, we don't say vegan banana, right? We don't have to say vegan in front of everything. It's not a separate food group. Vegans are guilty of this. Non-vegans are guilty of thinking only vegans eat vegan food when in reality. It's also vegans who perpetuate the idea that vegan food is its own food group. If you pay attention, just the slightest bit, you will notice perhaps yourself, but you will definitely notice vegans saying vegan before everything they say, especially when they're talking about food. I believe that we are never going to normalize veganism if we keep making it sound like it's an exclusive group or club. Now, it might take getting used to saying things for non-vegans and vegans to hear, like, I had a delicious French toast for breakfast, as well as a yummy blueberry muffin. Now, invariably, a non-vegan, or perhaps a vegan, might be perplexed and say, you mean vegan French toast, right? Because you're vegan. And you might clarify by saying, well, yeah, of course it's vegan. I'm vegan. So, right. Now, I know there are vegans who say, but we want people to know that everything's vegan and that there are so many vegan food options out there and that we can eat vegan and not be limited and restricted. And so, Colleen, you're making it sound like you want us to use the word vegan less, when in reality, we need to use it more because people need to understand what it means and we need to celebrate it and clarify what vegan means because people don't understand what vegan means. Okay. First of all, calm down. I am not saying don't celebrate being vegan. I'm saying if our goal is to normalize a compassionate way of eating and living, then we need to consider our language. Absolutely celebrate the fact that you're living in a way that's a manifestation of your deepest values of compassion, kindness, and wellness. Be vegan. Say you're vegan loud and proud. What I'm suggesting is, for instance, if you're vegan... If your friends and your family and your followers on social media know you're vegan, do you really need to precede every meal, recipe, dish, food, restaurant you talk about as vegan? Now, I'm not talking about hashtags. It's kind of a different situation. I'm talking about your language in your caption, but also in your words in a video. Isn't the point to celebrate the abundance that is vegan? If so, then share the meal, the food, the dish, the recipe, the restaurant as you already are. And in the context of your post or your statement or your declaration, if you're speaking in person, etc., whatever, in whatever medium you're sharing your enthusiasm, if you're sharing it in context, if you're sharing a dish or a recipe or a restaurant or food or a meal, won't they already know that what you're talking about is animal product free? I mean, I was watching an Instagram story of a vegan author who was on a vegan trip and she was showing, she was doing a video of the breakfast buffet. Now, just to set the stage, she's a vegan author 
her name on her social media accounts is vegan, blah, blah, blah. It's in the names of all of her books. She wears vegan message shirts. And she was on a vegan trip and tagging the name of that vegan trip while also including text on the video that indicated that they were on a vegan trip eating a vegan breakfast. So chances are the people watching the video know it's an animal product free breakfast. But I watched her and then I had to stop because every single thing she showed, she prefaced with vegan. So we have vegan pancakes and vegan sausage and vegan bread and vegan chocolate sauce and vegan crepes and vegan. We know it's vegan because you're vegan and you're on a vegan trip, right? Because let me tell you something, someone who's not vegan watching that video, I, I mean, I actually found it distasteful being vegan, <laughs> but someone who's not vegan watching that video, sure, they may think, oh, wow, I didn't know all that stuff could be made vegan. But they'd also think that if you had just prefaced it with maybe in the beginning, just saying like there's a vegan breakfast or a vegan buffet or there's no animal products in this buffet, and then proceeded to just say, we have pancakes, we have sausage, we have bread, we have biscuits, we have crepes, we have chocolate sauce, whatever it is you're celebrating, they'll still be impressed. But when you put vegan in front of every single food item, to be honest, it just sounds unappealing because it sounds like every one of those items is somehow different from the quote unquote regular or normal ones that people are used to. Now, full disclosure, I have totally been guilty of this. I'm just mindful of it. Sometimes David has come home from the store with a new food item, a new product, and I'm like, oh wow, that's really cool. And it's vegan, huh? And he goes, yeah, it's, yeah, it's vegan. Um, we're vegan? He's not like, oh shoot, God, you're right. We're vegan. I didn't think about that. I should go get something vegan. Like, Yes, it's vegan, so I don't have to ask him to clarify. I mean, some of it is sometimes it's incredulity because we're like, really? That's, I can't, that's amazing. But I, I'm guilty of this as well. And I'm just trying to be mindful of it. Now, I've talked ad nauseum about not using words like regular or normal when we're talking about cow's milk or animal-based sausage and not using words like alternative and substitute and analog and replacement and fake and faux to talk about plant-based meats, milks, and cheeses because those words normalize animal products and they make them seem like they're the barometers by which all other foods are measured. Well, vegan bread does the same thing. It just makes it sound like it's its own food group and it's different from what people associate with or uh, understand. It just makes it seem like it's a different kind of bread. It's somehow different. It's somehow only for vegans. It's somehow in its own category, right? Just say bread. Now, with all things, there are gray areas and there are exceptions. And yes, sometimes in a particular context, it's helpful to say vegan. I'm not saying to never do this. I'm saying just be mindful of when maybe it can be just not used sometimes because I imagine there are plenty of circumstances when it doesn't, we don't have to say vegan, vegan, vegan. So sometimes it is helpful to say vegan uh, to make sure you're getting the dish you want without animal products. But frankly, I've said this before too, I actually think it's more helpful to supplement vegan with exactly what vegan means. For instance, if you're in a restaurant and you're ordering something and you just say, can you make sure that dish is vegan? That's not enough to clarify that for the server. And you may get something that has honey or you may get something that has cheese because some people think honey or cheese or fish or what have you is in the category of vegan. So I I don't think it's enough to just say, can I make, can you make that dish vegan? What I'll often say is something like, I'm interested in that bruschetta. Can you just confirm that there's no cheese or dairy or obviously meat or anything like that, right? I'm vegan, so I just want to make sure, right? So you say you're vegan, but you clarify what it means for that dish to not have animal products in it. If you just said, make sure it's vegan, it's not enough in my opinion. To be sure, say you're vegan, but don't rely on the word to carry the meaning you want to convey. And that leads me to another way I think we overuse the word vegan. I've been thinking a lot about how we call both products or restaurants vegan as well as people, right? I'm vegan and I eat vegan food at vegan restaurants. No, no, no. I, I'm, I'm hoping to convince you to stop doing that, but that's what we say, right? I'm vegan and the food I eat is vegan and the restaurants I eat at are vegan. When it comes to identifying as vegan ourselves, sure, that makes sense, obviously, 
an I, it's an identity label, as is plant-based, as is flexitarian, as is lacto-ovo-vegetarian. Those are identity labels. Saying we're vegan or so-and-so is vegan signifies that it's a particular lens through which we see the world. It's a particular identity. But then we also use it to talk about a restaurant or a product or a food, as I described above, and hoping that you're going to probably quell that a little bit. But then we talk about it as an identity, as, as, you know, as a person being vegan. So I've been thinking about how I, I, I'm very aware of when I hear vegan food or it's a vegan muffin or it's a vegan, I don't know, recipe that it just sounds weird to me because my food doesn't have a self-proclaimed identity. It's just free of animal products, right? I mean, it's it's for the same reason that I don't tend to talk about animals as being vegan. Like some advocates talk about the fact that cows are vegan or ox are vegan. Uh, they're so strong. And of course they're strong. They're vegan. Well, no, they're not vegan. They're not taking on an identity. Physiologically, they're herbivores, just as physiologically animals who are obligated to eat other animals are carnivores. To draw the analogy further, we wouldn't call them carnists. They're carnivores, right? So I've just been thinking, I just, I, I think it's another way that we overuse vegan and I think it loses its power. I think it loses its meaning and I think it confuses the public. And I also think it's not accurate and I also think it's not effective. So that's how I usually use the word vegan. I tend to talk about people as being vegan, but food being, well, animal product free or plant-based or meat-free or dairy-free or egg-free, or one word I use a lot to talk about it is edible. Plants are edible, animals are not, animal products are not, right? So just, I tend to reserve vegan for the, uh, the identity of living in such a way that aspires to not contribute to violence against animals. I feel like it carries a lot of weight to talk about food being vegan. I think A, it overuses the word vegan. It makes it flabby and meaningless. I think B, it makes it seem like the food we call vegan can and should be eaten only by vegans. And I don't think that's, I think that's problematic to characterize it that way. C, relatedly, I think that it sounds like it's a special food group, right, related to that, oh, that it's that that food that's not in that group is normal or regular, and this is a special food group. Um, and D, I think it just muddies the waters when we use the same word for an identity and for a recipe uh, and for an animal, to be honest. Um, now, that's not my primary objection to overusing it. I get that words have more than one meaning, and that's fine. I get it. Food products even get certified vegan and carry the vegan society's V symbol, certifying that the product is free of animal products. And I think also that it wasn't tested on animals. I think that also means that. I, I totally get why those kinds of certifications are helpful to be able to turn a package over and see that the V symbol is there. It's really helpful. And it means you don't have to read the ingredients, even though I, I probably still read the ingredients because we probably go, really? It's vegan? And then we look at what the ingredients are, even if it says V for vegan on it. So I get that. I'm not opposed to that. And I'm not opposed to, I get that when we talk about a restaurant, that's 100% vegan. It's it's helpful to say that. It clarifies things when we say, hey, I'm going to go to this vegan restaurant. Or did you know a new vegan restaurant just opened? Or there are more vegan restaurants. Or you know, look at all the vegan restaurants in this city. I get that. We know what that means. We know that it means that no dishes there are made with animal products. Or there's, you know, we get that. Same thing if we said it's a vegetarian restaurant. We know that it means probably that dairy products or eggs are being sold and possibly even fish because we know that some people think fish or plants. When we say vegan, vegan restaurant, uh, it clarifies things. Even if we say vegan restaurant versus plant-based restaurant, we know that the latter may focus more on whole foods. And so there's a distinction even between vegan and plant-based. So I get that it really clarifies things when we say vegan restaurant. I'm not being rigid about this. I'm not saying to never use it. I'm just saying I'm being more consci conscious and cautious about not overusing the word vegan. So I get that in some cases it's necessary. But in my advocacy and among my friends uh, and just, just kind of just in my own habits, I'm, I'm being mindful of not overusing the word. Uh, I pref prefer to reserve vegan to talk about people and other words to talk about food or products or restaurants when possible, although sometimes it's not always uh, 
possible to do so. So that's my intention is to normalize the eating of plants and to denormalize the eating of animal flesh and fluids. And I'm always thinking of the best ways we can do that. That's why I'm sharing this with you. There's another aspect of the word vegan that I think can be problematic, and that is how we define vegan to ourselves and to others. Now, you heard me say that vegan is an identity, I said just just a little while ago. I said it's a lens through which we view the world, and no doubt you've heard me say a million times, and I'm never going to stop saying it, that vegan is not an end in itself, it's a means to an end. My goal is not to be as vegan as possible. My goal is to be as compassionate as possible, and veganism is a pretty effective and logical way to manifest that goal, to make that goal happen, right? In other words, my goal is compassion, and being vegan is a means through which I can achieve that goal to cause as little harm as possible. My goal is not to be vegan. Veganism, to me, is not an ideology. It's a manifestation of my values and my goals. It's even a manifestation of an ideology I do hold, but that ideology isn't veganism. Let me explain. As an animal advocate, my goal is to help animals and to avoid contributing to violence against them. My desire is to live in such a way that doesn't cause harm as much as I'm able to to do that. Being vegan helps me accomplish these goals. The goals are the end. Veganism is the means to that end. When it comes to an ideology I hold, it's not veganism per se. My ideology isn't veganism for its own sake. Rather, an ideology I hold is that animals are not here for humans to use and abuse. That's an ideology I adhere to, that animals don't exist for human purposes, that they exist for their own purposes, that if they have life, they want to keep it. If they have offspring, they want to nurture them. If they have wings and legs, they want to use them. That ideology dictates my thinking and drives my behavior, and it's what I believe should drive government policies. That's an ideology that leads to my being vegan, and it's an ideology that can be taught and learned. Because if enough people hold that ideology and not only change their behavior, government policies, and economic systems, then it will ultimately result in animals not being exploited and abused by humans. And that's the goal. My personal purity is not. Does that make sense? Veganism is a manifestation of my values of compassion and kindness and my ideology of animal autonomy, but it's not a value in and of itself. I don't live according to veganism. I live according to my ethics and my desire to affect change. If advocates keep talking about being vegan as the goal rather than the means to the goal, we're, we're going to continue to see a limited number of people become vegan. What's more, if we keep telling people to go vegan, we will also see few results. And unfortunately, the majority of vegan advocates use go vegan as their mantra. So if there's anything you take away from this episode, I hope it's this. Everyone who uses go vegan as their message of advocacy, and there are millions who do, may want to consider the research that shows, this is not just my opinion, even though I've been saying this for years, there is research and data that shows that people respond better to language of values than ideology. This is not my opinion. This is not about veganism. This is about any kind of values-based movement. And to most people, veganism is not a value. Let me say that again. (laughs) The research shows that people respond better to the language of values rather than language of ideology. And to most people, veganism is not a value. To us, and to me, as I keep emphasizing, it's a manifestation of values, kindness, simplicity, responsibility, self-care, Those are values in people's minds, but veganism is not a value in people's minds. In fact, most people perceive veganism as an ideology. And I would argue that some of the reason for that is the way vegans talk about veganism. 
Now, some of it's going to be because of misconceptions that non-vegans hold. Some of it is going to be because of their own resistance and their own bias. But we have to take responsibility. We can only take responsibility for our own advocacy and our own language. We can't take responsibility for how people are going to interpret it. But we can take responsibility for what words and language we do use and what methods we do use. So in other words, when advocates exclaim, go vegan, on messages, on shirts, on hashtags, on captions, on literature, on handouts, on social media, in every way, and this is done constantly on billboards, in films, in books, right? When we say go vegan, we're not really speaking to a value or an identity that has the potential to resonate with people. What's more is treating veganism as an identity that people should adopt usually backfires because many people associate veganism as being antithetical to their existing identities as men, as mothers, as Italians, as Americans, as conservative, as Southern, whatever, all the identities that different people hold, veganism appears to be antithetical to many of them. And I discuss this in The Joyful Vegan in great detail. So if we're thinking strategically as advocates, then the message we want to communicate cannot simply be go vegan, because to most people, vegan is an ideology, and adhering to an ideology is not a values-based goal. It's not a moral goal for people. Being a good person is a moral goal. Being kind is a moral goal. Not hurting anyone is a moral goal. So break down veganism into the language of values and morals instead. Frame your message in terms of moral goals such as compassion, justice, kindness, protection, simplicity, nonviolence, wellness, non-harm, and integrity, and you'll be much more effective. Don't just say go vegan. It's one of the reasons why one of the bumper stickers that I had when I first became vegan, and I still love that message, it's such a simple one, and I don't see it used a lot, is be kind to animals, don't eat them. Because people would look at that first part of the bumper sticker. I would see them have, I mean, I'm saying bumper sticker. You could use this anywhere. I mean, obviously now, especially on social media, on a shirt, etc. But people would see, be kind to animals. And immediately their minds would say, oh, I'm kind to animals. And then it would, then they'd see, don't eat them. And they'd go, oh, Ooh, that kind of, that's, that's kind of contradicting what I, how I think about myself and what I do and who I think I am. So that's an example of that. But if, if it just said, be kind to animals, go vegan, it just doesn't, it just doesn't resonate with people. It just, it's too vague and it's too, it's too flabby as I, as I said. So do you understand what I'm saying here? I am not saying to never use the word vegan. I'm saying to define veganism as a means to an end rather than an end in itself. I'm saying that telling people to go vegan doesn't work because vegan doesn't mean anything to them. There's no values associated with that for them. And if it does mean anything to them, it usually means ideology rather than values. So in terms of advocacy, speak in terms of values, not ideology. I'm not saying to stop identifying as vegan. I'm saying unpack the word vegan for people so it's associated with things they can identify with and that they're proud of and that they actually count as part of their identity. I'm proud to identify as vegan. It's who I am. It's how I live. I call myself the joyful vegan. This is not to say to not use the word, of course. And this topic of vegan as identity of how we need to embrace our identity, of how this identity appears to threaten our other identities, which is often why family and friends get so defensive about our being vegan. All of this needs to be addressed, and I don't think it's being talked about enough. I take great care to do so in many chapters in my new book, In the Joyful Vegan, in the chapter on coming out, in the chapter on fundamentalism and evangelism, in the chapter on communication, because how we talk about veganism determines how people will perceive it and whether they'll embrace it as their own identity or not. People are not going to embrace veganism if they don't understand what it means, if they think it's about purity and perfection, if they think it's about fundamentalism and dogma, and if they think that they can't even use the word vegan, 
unless it reflects a very rigid definition that is being narrowed every day by vegan fundamentalists. Yes, I said vegan fundamentalists are narrowing the definition of the word vegan, to my opinion, to the detriment of the shared goal we all have of helping animals. Now, I know some vegans will bristle at being called fundamentalist due to the negative connotations of that word and its association with conservative religious views, but just a cursory understanding of religious fundamentalism makes the parallels all too apparent. And my thoughts here are all in the Joyful Vegan. I have this all written out in the Joyful Vegan. Some of this is directly excerpted from it. And fundamentalism, in the religious sense, refers to a coalition of American Protestants who oppose theological liberalism, modernism, and rationalism, and who insist on the infallibility and inerrancy of the Bible. That, that is what fundamentalism in the religious sense tends to refer to. More broadly, in both religious and secular contexts, a fundamentalist is a person who, quote, adheres strictly or dogmatically to the fundamental tenets or principles of any subject, discipline, or movement. Fundamentalism in the general sense is characterized by rigid adherence to certain doctrines, scriptures, ideologies, or principles, intolerance for diversity of opinion, and belief in the importance of maintaining in-group and out-group distinctions with an emphasis on purity and the return to a former ideal. Does this sound familiar? Looking at the main features of fundamentalism, it is not hard to recognize its presence in the vegan community. Now, I'm using Christian fundamentalism here for illustrative purposes, but fundamentalism is prevalent in other religions as well. But let's just look at this. Let's just break down what fundamentalism is and how it might appear in vegan rhetoric in the vegan community and vegan ideology and philosophy. So fundamentalists believe in the authority of a written word. For Christian fundamentalists, it's the Bible in its current form. For vegan fundamentalists, it's one particular iteration of the definition of veganism. Fundamentalists believe in the inerrancy of that written word. For Christian fundamentalists, that means they believe that every word in the Bible is divinely inspired and cannot be changed or disputed. For vegan fundamentalists, it means that the singular definition of veganism attributed to vegan society founder Donald Watson is definitive, authoritative, and incontestable, despite the fact that it was devised and continually revised by various founders and members of the UK Vegan Society from its very beginning and throughout the mid-20th century. Fundamentalists rigidly adhere to rules, ideologies, and dogma without question. For religious fundamentalists, these rules are manifested as doctrines, sacraments, commandments, observances, and laws. For vegan fundamentalists, these rules are manifested in intolerance for exceptions, mistakes, intolerance for incremental steps, imperfection, or differences in philosophy. People who say they're 99.9% .9 vegan are denounced by fundamentalists for not being 100% vegan, and laws that improve the welfare of farmed animals are condemned because fundamentalists would argue they still condone a system of oppression. Moreover, the very act of questioning, just questioning certain aspects of veganism or acknowledging that there are gray areas or acknowledging can we even talk about the possibility that welfare laws might actually be favorable to farmed animals. Just the very act of questioning these things is interpreted as being a disloyal or inauthentic vegan. Fundamentalists are intolerant of nuance and diversity of opinion and exile those who don't agree with their perspective. That's a general characteristic of fundamentalists. In both religious and secular fundamentalism, those who don't conform are considered heretics or traitors and are silenced, ostracized, or otherwise punished. In vegan fundamentalism, dialogue is shut down by dismissing perceived dissenters as not being quote-unquote real vegans, banning them from online forums, and even shouting down and silencing speakers at public events. 
Fundamentalists believe in the importance of maintaining in-group and out-group distinctions. Religious fundamentalists dismiss out-groups as infidels. Vegan fundamentalists take moral audits not only of non-vegans as an obvious out-group, but also of those who self-identify as plant-based. In other words, even when people abstain from eating animal flesh and fluids, vegan fundamentalists consider them part of the out-group and characterize them as frauds or imposters if they're not doing it, quote, for the animals. Justifying the distinction, they cite their own authoritative understanding of the word vegan, assert their exclusive claim to the word, and marginalize those who interpret it differently. Conversely, plant-based fundamentalists also create in-group and out-group distinctions, dismissing vegans who eat, quote, processed foods or who don't follow a strict diet of whole foods as, quote, junk food vegans. The groups get factionalized further still into abolitionists versus welfareists, for example, or in the health arena, those who are raw foodists, whole foods, plant-based, SOS free, like salt, oil, and sugar free, uh, high carb, low fat, and so on. Fundamentalists excommunicate, banish, or shun members as punishment for not adhering to doctrine. That's a general characteristic of fundamentalists. They excommunicate, banish, or shun members as punishment for not adhering to doctrine. Different religions practice various forms and severity of excommunication from completely severing someone's ties to the church to allowing them to partake in some aspects while denying them access to others. Vegans can't kick people out of the club because there's no homogenous club, but they can deny people legitimacy and identity. Vegan fundamentalists decry the use of the label vegan for anyone who doesn't tick all the boxes of what they say vegan means, and they call anyone who doesn't submit to their interpretation fake vegans. It may not be a literal excommunication, but it's a kind of rhetorical excommunication. The average person who stops eating meat, dairy, and eggs is not looking for a tribal identity. They're just looking to manifest their compassion or eat more healthfully. Labeled as selfish for abstaining from animal products only for health reasons, they're forbidden to call themselves vegan by the fundamentalists who guard the word as jealous lovers rather than embrace potential allies. Fundamentalists reject anyone who fails the impossible litmus test they've devised, in which no one, even them, can pass. One of the downsides to seeing everything through this lens is that we come to feel that groups similar to our own undermine the very nature of what makes our group unique. Social psychologists even have a name for this. They call it categorization threat or distinctiveness threat. When groups too similar to our own threaten the special identity of our group. This may explain why people who self-identify as ethical vegans spend so much time criticizing people who stop eating animal products for health reasons. It may also explain why people who self-identify as plant-based spend so much time criticizing people they consider junk food vegans. These groups may have different underlying goals, but ironically, it's actually the commonalities between them, the choice to stop eating meat, dairy, and eggs that create the tension. This connects to what Sigmund Freud called the narcissism of minor differences. It's the phenomenon that it is precisely communities with adjoining territories, and this is a quote, and who are related to each other in other ways who are engaged in constant feuds and in ridiculing each other, Germans and South Germans, the English and the Scotch, and so on. In our case, animal welfareists and animal liberationists, ethical vegans and health vegans, and all the subcategories within, in being obsessed with our minor differences, we lose sight of our major goals. It's not that we shouldn't have an ideal to aspire to or a code to live by. But when ideology becomes a holy relic to be worshipped rather than an aspiration and a guide, we've lost the plot. When we become more attached to the belief system, then to the potential for that belief system to help us accomplish our goals, we've lost our way. We mistake the finger pointing to the moon for the moon itself.
In The Joyful Vegan, I go into great detail about some of the issues I named above, including the categorization threat, narcissism of small differences among vegans and plant-based folks, as well as the narrowing of the definition of veganism that I find incredibly problematic. I talk a little bit about this in the podcast episode I did called I Am Not Evil and Neither Are You, Tribalism, Ideology, and a Call for Unconditional Compassion. But this is what troubles me. There are a number of vegans trying to change or at least narrow the definition of what it means to be vegan, asserting that to be truly vegan, it's not enough to forswear animal flesh, fluids, and fabrics. According to them, you also have to tick these boxes. You have to be an animal activist in order to call yourself vegan. You have to identify as liberal, feminist, intersectionalist, anti-capitalist, anti-vaccine, atheist, agnostic, and so on. You have to renounce foods that are not also fair trade, palm oil free, organic and GMO free. And then you can call yourself vegan. Though the intentions are good, I get why people are concerned about these things. It's not that you can't be any of those things or live according to those things. It's that the result in saying that those are the criteria by which you can call yourself vegan what happens is that you've narrowed now rather than broadened the vegan pool. As you add criteria to the definition of veganism, fewer and fewer people qualify. And by making the door through which people can walk even smaller, fewer and fewer people will cross the threshold or even want to. The number of people who meet the basic and widely understood definition of veganism is already pretty small. Do we want to make it smaller? If believing that it's better to eat plants rather than animals is the only thing we agree on, that's enough. That's a lot. That's really what vegan means. But when we try to make vegan a huge vat that encompasses every problematic practice on the planet, it becomes meaningless. To be vegan, the only price of admission in my book is that we do the best we can to not contribute to violence against animals and what we eat and what we buy and what we support. Does motivation matter? possibly in terms of whether you'll stay vegan or not. And I do talk about that in The Joyful Vegan. But you can call yourself vegan, even if you stop eating animal products for health reasons or environmental reasons or ethical reasons or religious reasons, if that word resonates with you, if that's an identity that you, that you embrace with all its imperfections and all its good intentions, then that's up to you if you want to identify as vegan. Whatever your motivation, if you're using veganism as a means to reach your goal of compassion, of kindness, of wellness, of animal protection and autonomy, then you're vegan. Regardless of your political views, what types of plant foods you eat, whether you eat minimally processed foods or highly processed foods, whether you're for vaccines or against them, whether you're Republican or Democrat or liberal or progressive or conservative, you can call yourself vegan. Whether you're pro-choice, anti-choice, feminist, anti-feminist, hell, even if you're an a-hole, if you're not eating animal flesh and fluids and you're committed to being open to other ways you can live compassionately and consciously. If you identify with the word vegan, then you're vegan. And don't let anyone tell you otherwise. For The Animals, this is Colleen Patrick-Gaudreau. Thanks for listening. 